When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be the host of a series of educational YouTube videos featuring quirky stories from Minnesota's past. But let's say you wanted to be a mail carrier. Who's your role model for that anyway? Our mailman has a long day. No, no thank you. Instead, you'll want to look to the fastest, coolest, dog sleddingest, most bad <laughs> mail carrier who ever lived. Minnesota's own, John Bear Grease. Welcome to Minnesota Historia. I'm Haley, your guide to the legend of John Bear Grease. If you've already heard of John Bear Grease, it's probably because there's a sporting event named after him. We call it the, the premier sled dog race in the lower 48 states. This is Mike Keyport. He's John Bear Grease's great grandson and a race official for the John Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon. Racers travel 300 miles from a bar in Duluth to a casino in Grand Portage. So, if you're a dog who likes to drink and then gamble, this is the race for you. It really took off because there was some local mushers here around the Cook County area that did their own sled dogging, and they said, well, we gotta call it something. What are we gonna call this race? Hortons, Maud, Dale. And somebody remembered that John Bear Grease delivered mail via sled dog, and it clicked. John Bear Grease was born in 1858. That's the same year Minnesota was born as a state. Twinsies? John was born here, in Beaver Bay, Minnesota. They built a whole sign about it. And he did live in a wigwam right on Lake Superior and the Beaver River. Later, as development happened, of course, they did get into a house. Young John grew up hunting and fishing and running with his dogs in the Minnesota wilderness. In his teens, he worked as a sailor on Lake Superior. I found no evidence that he dreamed of growing up to carry letters and catalogs and packages, but he was ideally suited for it. If he wanted to deliver the mail here in the late 1800s, before there were roads or cars or airplanes, you had two options. Neither one of them is great. Option one, the cold, unforgiving death trap that is Lake Superior. Good luck with the not drowning in a watery grave thing. Option two, the rocky, roadless, tree-choked terrain of the North Shore. Good luck with the moose and the bears and the not getting hopelessly lost. Unless, of course, you're John Bear Grease. John Bear Grease doesn't get lost. There was a trail that was used basically by the natives. Some of these trails him and his brother made themselves. When they learned of this federal government mail contract, it was kind of a no-brainer because we're already using these trails. So they'd sign a contract every year with the federal government. In 1879, at the age of 21, he signed on to deliver the mail once a week to the entire North Shore. In the winter, he usually went by dog sled. The summer was for sailing. He made a makeshift canoe and actually put a sail on it. Yeah, he not only knew the land, but he knew the lake. They nicknamed him the renowned pilot of Lake Superior. Despite being famous for dog sledding, John Bear Grease actually preferred the lake. The trail was rough because of the terrain here on the North Shore. It's mountainous, it's hilly, it's up and down. I don't know how many streams and rivers you cross, but it was much easier to use Lake Superior. When ice would form on Lake Superior, he would skip the trail because it was quicker to go on frozen water, but Lake Superior being Lake Superior had shifting ice, which had to have been extremely dangerous. Of course, John Bear Grease wasn't the only mail carrier on the North Shore. His brothers helped, and a man named Louis Plant often covered the route north of Grand Marais. But John Bear Grease was the most famous. People loved him. He not only brought physical mail, but he brought information and news. People in the town would hear them bells coming, and they, as he got to the post office, the community would all come together. And he was tireless. You know, the old saying, the mail must go through, and he would make it happen one way or another. This episode of Minnesota Historia is brought to you by Bear Grease. That was a fake commercial break, but I do want to talk to you about Bear Grease for a moment. Bear Grease is a slightly more disgusting term for bear fat, and I am not body shaming these bears. They're supposed to be fat. It's for hibernation, just as nature intended bear hunters and melt it down, kind of like you would rendering the fat from a, from a pig. Now I don't use bear grease in my daily life, but once upon a time, everyone did. 
for everything. Cooking, grooming hair, face painting, waterproofing, conditioning hides, lubricating, insect repellent, and as a cure for baldness, because bears are so hairy. No, really, that was their thinking. Speaking of bear grease, our John Bear Grease stopped delivering mail on April 26th, 1899. Early on, there was probably only a couple, three, four communities, and as time went, then there was more post office stops. More post offices meant more mail, and the trail John Bear Grease had expertly navigated for so many years was now a big, boring road. Any rando with a horse and buggy can deliver mail on that. John Bear Grease died in 1910 after rescuing another mail carrier from a Lake Superior storm. This is the picture of John Bear Grease at his end of life, and that's the picture my mother doesn't like, but I do, because I think it's a very realistic picture after all them years of work. And that might be the end of our story if it weren't for the Sled Dog Marathon. The only other thing is, if you're not aware, that we've had these mailbags for a year. It says Bear Grease Station on them, but each and every year, every musher in the marathon is legally sworn in as an official United States mail carrier. They what? They carry it from start to finish of the race, actual United States mail. So mushers, please stand. So they actually have a United States Postal Service representative come to opening ceremonies and they all stand there. I state your name. And legally get sworn in as mail carrier for three days and then they don't get to carry mail anymore. But <laughs> the veterans, they look forward to it. I think some of the rookies go, what, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, I'm doing what? I'm carrying mail, what? Yeah, that was my exact reaction. No packages. <laughs> oh. We'll leave that to John Bear Grease because apparently he could handle it, but. <laughs> and that's not the only way they honor John Bear Grease. As mushers go out of the chute, we let them go every two minutes, keeping them a little distance apart logistically for a safer start. But somebody came up with the idea that John Bear Grease should be the first musher out. It's a great day in the Northland. We actually have Ken Bueller do our announcing each and every year. They do a countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, and when it gets to one, John Bear Grace is out the chute. He will be the first one out on the marathon trail. We honor the tradition of his people and the perseverance of his time, and he leaves now. John Bear Grace, miigwish! John Bear Grace, miigwish! And it's, it's a, uh, most people get it. And you know, there's a lot of hype at the beginning of the race. But at that time, everybody kind of hushes. What a beautiful way to honor John Bear Grace. I did not know there was going to be a supernatural element to this story. John Bear Grease running with his dogs more than 140 years after he started. That rolls. Hello, I've been asked to make an interstitial for Minnesota Historia. An interstitial is a short piece of video that plays before, after, or during your regular programming to encourage you to keep watching. So to be clear, what you are watching at this very instant is not regular programming. And I don't know why I feel compelled to explain things to people. It's like a sickness. Anyway, please just keep watching. Minnesota has much to offer travelers to the state. Beautiful lakes, majestic trees, this weird magnetic rock on the Gunflint Trail. You might not think Minnesota would need to trick tourists into visiting its many attractions, but you would be wrong. Welcome to Minnesota Historia. I'm Haley, your guide to Minnesota's tourist traps. This is a tourist trap. This is also a tourist trap. I would argue these are tourist traps too. They're just a slightly different animal, so to speak. A tourist trap is any attraction built near a highway, designed to lure cars full of tourists into stopping and spending their money. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Many tourist traps offer wholesome family entertainment, like a fun museum or a petting zoo, maybe miniature golf. 
and they sold the things travelers needed most. Tiny flags, magnets, shaped like states. Cultural misappropriation. I don't resent tourist traps. I just want to understand them better. Let's start with the history of how Minnesota first started attracting tourists. 1917, the Great War raged across Europe. Bolsheviks revolted in Russia. Meanwhile, Minnesota just wanted more tourists to spend money here. That year, the 10,000 Lakes of Minnesota Association was formed. It was the first organized effort to attract tourists to our state. They came up with the nickname, Land of 10,000 Lakes. They also came up with the Bread and Butter State, which seems less inclusive for dairy or gluten intolerant travelers. Minnesota had a lot to offer. Plus, our summers were noticeably cooler. The Tourist Association came along at just the right time for America's growing middle class, which finally had leisure time and cars, and places to drive. By 1930, Minnesota boasted 2,600 miles of paved roads. The number of resorts exploded. Every year there were more campgrounds, parks, restaurants, highways, and of course, gift shops. Get ready for some more dates, history nerds. In 1926, Highway 61 was established from the Canadian border to the Crescent hugging the Mississippi River in the south and Lake Superior in the north, it's actually the prettiest road in the entire world. Just my opinion. In 1933, the State Tourism Bureau took over for 10,000 lakes because tourism had boomed from a $1 million a year business to more than 100 million. It was an era of excitement and adventure and freedom on the open road. Unless, of course, you weren't white. Brief but important tangent. You're probably familiar with the Green Book Guides published from 1936 to 1966 by New York mail carrier Victor Green. They listed businesses that were guaranteed safe for black travelers to visit without discrimination in every state, including Minnesota. It listed hotels like London Road Court in Duluth, restaurants like Herman's Steaks in Motley, and yes, even early tourist traps like the Covered Wagon in St. Paul. The Covered Wagon was a restaurant shaped like a covered wagon and it got listed almost every year. Total win-win for travelers. By the mid 60s, civil rights legislation made green books somewhat less necessary and they stopped publishing. At the exact same time, Minnesota was building its interstate highway system. Travel was more accessible to more people than ever before. Welcome to the golden age of the Minnesota tourist trap. We just call ourselves a classic tourist trap, as in classic. It's a derogatory term for, for an honorable profession as far as I'm concerned. That's Bill Weckman, proprietor of Tom's Locking Camp on the North Shore of Lake Superior. And if you doubt his commitment to wholesome family entertainment, just watch him gently shepherd this beautiful butterfly out of his gift shop. Out the door. There we go. Shoot him out. Let's go. <laughs> It was a morning cloak butterfly. It was my first butterfly this year. Of course, there are many other classic tourist traps operating in the state. There's the Spam Museum, the Mall of America, the world's largest sugar beet. What's that one down in uh, uh, Treasure City? Treasure City's still operating. People talk about that. But Tom's Logging Camp is one of the best examples of a tourist trap still standing in Minnesota because it has not changed in decades and we don't change anything that we haven't had to. If there's no reason to, to do it, we don't do it. Well, it started in 1956, started by Tom Debach. The gift shop was uh, the focus, and then he had a lot of stuff that he'd collected over the years. He's not joking, there's a lot of stuff. All the stuff that they use for logging with horses, and it's in eight different buildings out there. Harness shop, barn, bunkhouse, cook shack, blacksmith shop. I'm intrigued, tell me more. We're gonna take a quick tour of Tom's Logging Camp. Edit that out, that was really cheesy. Oh, our editor doesn't listen to me. That's why I look so ridiculous most of the time. And it's a, it's a self-guided tour. This is a history of, of logging in, in the northern states. But this is the harness shop warehouse and shoeing stall. Nailed it. Now we're heading for the chainsaws. 
So this is the chainsaw display, which is not period appropriate, but it's become one of the most popular things that we do. Well, this is the blacksmith shop. We've got all the explanations of what you're seeing. This guy, this guy really needs to be in the woods. He does not need to be in town. So this is the bunkhouse. This is the basic transportation building. I'm sorry to interrupt the tour, but I think we skipped the cook shanty. We cannot skip the cook shanty. Creepy nightmare mannequins are a staple of tourist traps. Yeah, that's the gravity house. That's what we call it. We've got the animals and the fish and the gravity house and the nature trail and things like that for mostly the kids. Another classic staple in many tourist traps, straying slightly off brand. That's the odds and ends building. That doesn't necessarily mean anything to everything else you've done today building. So this logging camp has an electric chair. And that's, that'll conclude the tour. <laughs> that is right on the edge. That is, that is, that's, that's a little dicey. Bill doesn't like the electric chair, but he's also reluctant to change anything. Even if it's a spoon on a wall, you don't move it. You don't do anything, but you never know who's gonna remember what. The Greek god Nostalgia is in charge here. It's too late to, too late to do anything about it. You know, I brought my dad to see your chair. <laughs> Hope it's still out there. The tour at Tom's logging camp is pretty wild, but as it is with any tourist trap, Tom's beating heart is its gift shop. I'm the purveyor of high-grade stupid stuff. Candy, cigarettes. Rattlesnake eggs in the envelope. Slingshots for bears. The old wire-wrapped plastic glob mood ring. These flavored sugar sticks. Switchblade cones. If we can find any of that stuff, we still stock it. Always, because that's, that's what you found back then when you were a kid, because everything changes and it's changing faster now. And it's terrible when the things you love go away. This is why I've closed my heart off to so many things. Why bother to love these tourist traps if they're just gonna leave you? Like everything leaves you. Yeah, there's been, uh, there's been a lot of things gone by the wayside. Like Split Rock Trading Post, a gift shop that featured a caged bear as an attraction. Since we get asked that a lot. Did you used to have bears? No, that was up the shore. Tourists would feed the poor critter marshmallows. And that, that's gone. Shadows of others remain, like Paul Bunyan's playground in Bemidji. Paul and Babe are still there, obviously. But if you want to experience the glory days of tourist traps in Minnesota, you're a few decades late. Most of that kind of thing has been, has been replaced by something. Usually something with gas pumps or something. Yeah, just goes away. I'm sorry, let's turn this thing around and try to end on a positive note. Remember, we have a room full of chainsaws. We have creepy lumberjack mannequins. We have flavored sugar sticks. Don't go away, we have more episodes of Minnesota Historia coming up. In 1962, at the beginning of the space race, at the height of the Cold War, who posed the biggest threat to the American way of life? Was it Nikita Khrushchev or Yuri Gagarin? No, it was this guy, the one with four legs, not the human. Because on November 13th, 1962, the United States government sentenced him to death. Welcome to Minnesota Historia. I'm Haley, your guide to Mr. Magoo, the mongoose, and other animals in wrong places. Imagine you're the director of the Lake Superior Zoo. I am the director of the Lake Superior Zoo. I know. But I meant you're the director in 1962, and also you're a man named Lloyd Hackle. You get a phone call on September 10th, 1962 from a sailor. He has a mongoose for sale, and he wants you to meet him at the docks. Now, if I'm Lloyd Hackle, my first thought is, this is the coolest phone call I have ever received. I'm living my best life. But my second thought is, we don't just buy random animals from sailors. But we certainly get a lot of calls of people, you know, well, I have this raccoon. Sometimes it's a deceased animal. Would you like it? Um, no, thank you. After Lloyd explains this, there's a long pause on the other end of the line. 
He will give it to him for zero dollars. Basically, it's a free mongoose. Lloyd agrees to these terms and sends his top zoo tenants to retrieve the bird, the mammal, this creature. What exactly is a mongoose? This furry little weasel-like creature first shows up in the fossil record 18.5 million years ago. It's a mammal, and they're great at killing snakes. You'll find them all over Africa and Asia. But you know where you'll never find them? Minnesota. Back at the zoo, Lloyd Hackle gave the mongoose a brief physical examination. We know it was brief because Lloyd didn't actually know all that much about mongooses. And I checked on the plural of mongoose. It is mongooses. Goose becomes geese. Moose are still moose. But more than one mongoose is mongooses. Don't ask me why English is so whack. I just work here. Lloyd counted five toes on each foot with small non-retractable claws, 40 teeth and ears with, and I quote, amazing fold construction. Get yourself a man who looks at you the way Lloyd Hackle looks at Mr. Magoo's ears. On the ship, Mr. Magoo had grown accustomed to riding around on his human companion's shoulders. He ate raw meat or oatmeal, and he preferred his tea with milk and sugar. He probably got into it because it was a British like ship, right? Like they must have had tea and obviously was uh, very refined. Ugh. So the zoo built him a house and drank tea with him almost every day because Mr. Magoo did not like to drink tea alone. What I really take from it is Mr. Magoo had a personality like none other. It feels like he's staring into my soul <laughs> with like one eye kind of like going this way and I think he's looking at me. After two months of this adorable behavior, the Duluth News and Tribune ran a photo of Mr. Magoo on Lloyd Hackle's shoulder. 300 papers picked up the story. The public was charmed, except of course, for Clarence Bingham, a US customs agent. He recognized the mongoose as a clear violation of US code title 18, paragraph 42, prohibiting the import or possession of this animal in the United States. Once the feds found out that we had this illegal alien, they were just, no, you, he must be executed. The federal government recommended that Mr. Magoo be seized and destroyed. This did not sit well with Lloyd Hackle. We don't have any evidence that he leaked news of this kidnapping and murder plot to the press, but somebody did. Calls started pouring into the zoo and the Duluth mayor's office and the newspaper. Letters too. And all clear we must have, else the American Revolution was in vain. God help us all. The most deadly animal we have in the US is that demon communist. It is a pity we don't have billions of mongooses here in the US and train them to cut these red communist throats. Have I mentioned what else was going on in the fall of 1962? It was the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it's worse than you think, thanks to a completely different animal in a completely different wrong place. On October 16th, President John F. Kennedy learned that the Soviet Union had placed nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba, just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, right here. Everyone in the military was on high alert, including everyone at the Duluth Air Defense Sector, which was a part of the Air Force. On October 25th, a shadowy figure attempted to scale the fence surrounding the Duluth facility. Okay, so obviously it was a bear. A guard shot at this so-called mysterious figure, again, just a bear, and the bear ran away. Meanwhile, this triggered an alarm at Volk Field in Camp Douglas, Wisconsin. Pilots there actually started their engines, so they could have flown up into the air and shot nukes at things. Fortunately, someone at Volk talked to someone at Duluth who told them not to blow up the world. Like I said, it was a tense time for humans, bears, mongooses, basically everybody. The most clear-headed comments come from zoo tenant zookeeper John Mealy. He spells it out like we're all a bunch of dum-dums, saying, this is a male mongoose. No females around, do you understand? Even if he did escape, what could he do? Freeze to death in Duluth's temperature of 20 below zero? Spread a deadly virus that would turn people to stone? Run to the woods and mate with a moose and create a monster? It's like the Napoleon Dynamite with the Liger. Okay, like how cool would that be? It'd be wild, but looking at him, and thinking about a moose, I mean, come on. John Mealy concluded by saying, no one makes mention that zoos have really dangerous animals and that we make it our business not to let anything escape. I have a confession to make. I secretly love it when animals escape and show up in wrong places. <laughs> I don't love that. Like the phantom kangaroos of Minnesota. 
Kangaroos were first spotted here, near Anoka in 1957. Reports persisted for 10 years of at least one kangaroo with abnormal strength, a vicious temperament, and a taste for killing pets. People named him Big Bunny. In 2005, a phantom kangaroo suddenly showed up outside of Cloquet. The zoo got a call. So we have two kangaroos. We count them every day. They live with a wallaby. Why would you bring the wallaby into this? In any case, the phantom kangaroo vanished. Nobody even bothered to give it a funny name. Clo kangaroo was just sitting right there. The, the idea of an animal being where they shouldn't be is very interesting to humans. That includes the Lake Superior Zoo's most famous escaped animal, Feisty, the seal. Perhaps you've seen the photo? Last year was a decade since the flood of 2012, and it was because a culvert failed. So all of this water backed up into the zoo within 20 minutes, and she ended up out on Grand Avenue. And just the, she, she looked scared, right? And it, it's a tough thing to talk about. I'm starting to regret my previous stance on escaped animals. Feisty survived, but what about Mr. Magoo? To learn his final fate, we return to 1962. At Duluth City Hall, the mayor was losing hope. Duluth's oldest radio station, WEBC, started a desperate no noose for the mongoose campaign. The Associated Press reported a fish and wildlife agent was already on the way to carry out the death sentence. At the zoo, director Lloyd Hackle was struggling. He said, I'm walking around with the key to his life in my pocket and the feeling that I should help plan his escape. It just like, Mr. Magoo, mongoose from India attracts much attention. He is the only mongoose in the United States. Another fun thing, like he was the only mongoose in the US. Like to have that, and, and I don't know why this is in here, but I absolutely love this picture. I don't know what it is. It kind of looks like a 1930s glamor shot. Then, November 19th, Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, ordered everyone to just chill out. Nobody was killing Mr. Magoo on his watch. Everybody just take it down a notch. And by May of 1963, Secretary Udall offered the mongoose a full federal pardon. It really got people excited, which I love, and then they, they spoke for him because he can't talk. So, and on behalf of Lloyd Hackle and everyone else involved, they were able to you know, stand up for him and really make a difference. So he got to live, he was not executed. Even President John F. Kennedy offered his opinion on the whole mongoose situation. He said, let this story of the saving of Mr. Magoo stand as the classic example of government by the people. And then Mr. Magoo died, five years later, peacefully on January 8th, 1968, after a long life of forced celibacy and drinking tea with his best buds at the zoo, where today you can still see the amazing fold construction of his little taxidermied ears. The only reason that he was taxidermied was his fame. He is famous and we wanted to have Mr. Magoo forever. We couldn't let him go. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. It was a, it's, he's pretty good. He's, he's cute. Oh, hello there, I almost didn't see you. I was cosplaying as Bluther, the retired PBS North Kids mascot. If Bluther were anything more than a disembodied fuzzy blue head, I'm sure he'd ask you to stay tuned for more Minnesota Historia. Here in Minnesota, we really like parades. We have them for all the normal occasions, Christmas, Labor Day, the 4th of July. Then we just started making up, like St. Urho's Day, fake holiday, fake saint. But the most whimsical, weirdest, and wettest excuse for a parade happens every spring in downtown Duluth. And it celebrates a tiny little bug-eyed silver fish that some people put in their mouths. We are gonna have a smelt parade. Welcome to Minnesota Historia. I'm Haley, your guide to the magic of smelting. Smelt. No, I'm not talking about the process of extracting metal from ore using heat, and I'm not invoking the flatulent proverb regarding the identity of whosoever may have dealt it. I'm talking about Oz Mary dye. That's the scientific name for smelt. These silvery little fish, usually less than nine inches long. Here's what they'd look like if they were puppets. These puppets are part of the annual Magic Smelt Parade in Duluth, Minnesota. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Duluth and smelt were synonymous. That's because the rivers and streams of Lake Superior once attracted thousands of smelters, hungry to catch the randy little fish trying to swim upstream to spawn. The smelt run was an annual rite of spring, like Easter, or a new Fast and Furious movie. 
Usually in mid to late April, people would gather on shore and scoop up nets and buckets and handfuls of these little silver things. I'm told they can be quite pretty, shimmering in the night like precious jewels. It's almost a religious experience for some smelters. Then you get to eat them. Of course, you do have to remove their guts, but their soft bones and delicate skin means you get to otherwise eat them whole. Phrases like soft bones and delicate skin are a big part of why I'm a vegetarian and not a serial killer. There weren't always smelt in Lake Superior. You know, that's part of the history that I can describe, how they got from Maine, which is where the eggs came from, to Lake Superior. So I'm Dr. Tom Robick. I'm a professor in the biology department. They first appeared in Lake Michigan in 1912. The predecessor to the Michigan DNR brought in millions of eggs and stocked them in multiple different locations. It's thought that the Crystal Lake egg plant was the source of the population and then spread rapidly from there. So they were in Lake Huron by the late 20s and into Lake Superior by the 30s and subsequently spread throughout most of the lakes. And about that same time, sea lamprey were also naturally spreading into Lake Superior. And sea lamprey are a parasitic invasive species. Like giant vampire leeches, they feasted on the trout that would have been eating the smelt. A rainbow smelt in the absence of a predator really had a chance to take off. And that's when the party began. And so I remember collecting them as a kid. You didn't really need to bring a net or anything. You just, just show up and grab them with your hands. It was like the hottest club in North America. Thousands of smelters on a beach wearing rubber pants. Like a carnival atmosphere. Everybody had, you know, lanterns going and people having a few libations. Of course, Beer leads to drunkenness and litter. And my favorite, public urination. That was the dark side of the smelt run. But like all great parties, this one ended with a whimper. The smelt population declined drastically in the 1980s. The Fishery Commission brought the lamprey down to a point where they could start to try and rehabilitate the lake trout stock. More trout meant less smelt, and an important part of Duluth's cultural history was suddenly in danger of being forgotten. That's when a hero stepped in to save history. And like all great heroes, this one came with puppets. But anyway, we want this to be real like Keystone Copy, kind of real fun. Meet Jim Ure, the co-founder and director of the Magic Smelt Puppet Troupe. The inspiration for it comes from the springtime smelt run. They're fish, they're silvery, you see them in the water and they're goofy, they run in packs and so we're running in packs too. There's an organization called In the Heart of the Beast Puppet and Mask Theater and I came to Minnesota to work with them. I also, you know, was curious about similar events in other parts of the world. I traveled to uh, Trinidad and went to Carnival and nothing like it, certainly in Duluth. And I've also been to the Second Line Parades in New Orleans and that was another major influence on the Smelt Parade. Second Line Parades are like regular parades except all the spectators actually joined the parade. The first line is made up of the floats and the bands. The second line is you, the regular spectators who hit the streets and dance behind the bands. This is not the kind of parade where you sit back passively and let other people throw candy at you. I just put two and two together, you know, I took my background as a puppeteer and some of the festivals that I have visited in other places and uh, just kind of put it all together and came up with the idea for the Magic Smelt Parade. Here's how it works. Uh, well, we all dress up in silver or gray, um, and we go over there and we uh, explain the origins of the Smelt Parade, kind of, and have a bunch of Smelt people come out and dance around. <laughs> These are the smelt people. You've got your smelt queen, your smelt guards, your smelt musicians, your smelt sheriff, your smelt pope, your smelt mom, your smelt baby, your smelt bot 3000, and they all get together at the beginning of the parade and put on a little pageant. Where we say the history of the smelt, but it's not real. Um, and we just, we have a good time. No! Lift up your voices and raise a great cheer for the magnificent Smelt Queen! Leading up to the parade, the Magic Smelt Puppet Troop hosts workshops. 
We have a basic costume that, you know, is our smelt character costume. And then people come to the workshop sometimes, you know, one guy said, well, I want to turn one into a wizard. And I said, great, we, let's, we need a smelt wizard. These workshops are for anyone attending the parade, as a performer or as an audience member. In my mind, by design, you know, there's no distinction between the audience and the performers. That is, you know, it's a moving party and everybody goes down, you know, the lake walk together. No one judges you and uh, it's sort of, yeah, that's what it's all about. You can just show up wearing any old thing, but again, silver and gray are the colors of the day. This is my sister's harvest dress, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's a gray dress, so I wore it. And then I made this with, um, I cut open a pillow and glued it into my umbrella. And then this is just a bag I got at the state fair. The parade starts in Canal Park, next to the aerial lift bridge. It travels the lake walk to Endian Station, where it takes a kind of dance break. Then everyone goes to a theater lobby and enjoys massive quantities of tiny fried fishes. But nobody's doing this for the tartar sauce. I've done it every year, because it's a fun like activity to do. And like Duluth is like a citizen. It's a fun thing to participate in, and it's a time to get dressed up and just have some fun. You know, let's think of the, the Smelt Kingdom as this sort of alternate or parallel you know, society below the waves. So really anything goes. A kingdom of smelt gathers with glee! Well, that was a pretty normal, straightforward episode of Minnesota Historia, but I still have some basic questions. Is Minnesota real? Do these things really happen here? Am I even real? You're watching Minnesota Historia, a production of PBS North. Let's dig into the Minnesota Historia mailbag and see what people are saying about us. Uh, Walt Dizzo, a trivia host and gad about town, writes, Minnesota Historia is the only thing worth watching on the internet. Thank you, Mr. Dizzo. That's a good reminder that you can find all of our old episodes on YouTube. And, uh, and it looks like most of the rest of these are from my mom. Do you remember what you were doing on the night of April 16th, 1902? I'm not accusing you of anything, but at 2 a.m., somebody set fire to the jail in Eveleth, Minnesota. Then, same night, just hours later, somebody else blew up the depot. The depot would have been in this general area. I mean, they just obliterated it. What kind of town is this Eveleth, anyway? Welcome to Minnesota Historia. I'm Haley, your guide to Minnesota's boomtown. Like. Literally, I guess. Welcome to Eveleth, home of the United States Hockey Hall of Fame, the world's largest hockey stick, the Eveleth Clown Band, a Carnegie Library, a Hippodrome, and one of Minnesota's last remaining video rental stores. I sure hope that's still open by the time we're done recording this episode, but I am seriously worried about their business model. Now let's dig into this quirky little town. Eveleth is located in Minnesota's Iron Range. See, it's right here on the edge of this little orange stuff. That orange stuff is the Mesabi Range, one of several large deposits of iron ore in northern Minnesota. There's also a Vermilion Range, a Gunflint Range, and a Cuyuna Range, which was named after Kyler Adams and his dog, Una. That is a true story. See, here's Una. In Minnesota, we just call this whole general area the Iron Range. Iron was first discovered here in 1884 by prospectors looking for gold. After that, towns just started popping up out of the ground like little groundhogs. At first it was Tower and then Sudan. Then they finally found iron a little further south and we got Virginia and Hibbing. Eveleth started in 1892 as a bunch of log cabins and a mining camp. In 1893, they built streets and buildings and held some elections. And then they discovered iron literally everywhere underneath Eveleth. So they decided to move the entire town, buildings and all. But don't worry, they moved entire towns all the time back then. Nobody thought it was weird. I think it's weird. This is Tucker Nelson an Iron Range historian who doesn't think it's weird that they moved the whole town. It's not unusual, uh, to quote Tom Jones. So behind me is where Eveleth was born. What's now a hole in the ground was the original town site. Starting in 1899, the buildings were moved up the hill to where Eveleth is now. It's behind the camera, in other words, is where Eveleth ended up. So, how do you move a whole town? It happened more slowly than that. 
with sleighs and logs and horses. They used a steam hoist on what's now Adams Avenue to haul the buildings up the hill. The largest building, which held the bank, newspaper, and drugstore, was moved in two pieces. Eveleth's Dr. Charles W. Moore complained about it later. Before the town was moved, we had acquired sidewalks and electric lights. <sighs> it was some time before we were so well equipped again. He also said everyone took the situation good-naturedly, but I have moved cats into new apartments, so I seriously doubt that. By the way, they also moved Hibbing in 1919, which was a much bigger town. Check out these photos. It really looks like they nailed it. This is the kind of thing that happens when you live in a boom town, and I don't mean in a town that blows up a lot. I mean a town undergoing rapid growth due to sudden prosperity. Although, Eveleth does blow up a lot, too. I haven't even told you about the spruce mine explosion on October 8th, 1900. The powder house for the spruce mine exploded. The building blew up. Mines need enormous stockpiles of explosive materials to move all that earth around. Newspaper accounts at the time differ a little bit as to how it may have started. The most popular theory is that a stray bullet hit the mine's powder house. The October 8th, 1900 Minneapolis Tribune said, the town of Eveleth presents a sorrowful sight. It looks as though a regiment of soldiers had passed through and looted the town. Almost every person has either their hands or heads bandaged, and the windows are barricaded with any sort of lumber attainable. I would hope that they stored their explosives a little bit differently after that event. The Spruce Mine is also notable for having the only movie theater in the world located 200 feet underground. In 1925, the owners of the mine turned an unused pump room into the Wilsonian Auditorium. I like to imagine miners watching the sci-fi epic Metropolis while snacking on their pizza and pasties. Metropolis is a movie about a futuristic utopian society that mistreats the working class by shoving them underground, so you can understand why I dream of showing it to miners in the 1920s. There's also a sexy robot but uh, they mostly just watched safety films down there. But occasionally the men might enjoy a, a comedy which would have still been silent at the time as the mine grew. This underground theater was almost certainly out of use if not destroyed by the 1940s. Now, let's burn this mother down. I'll, I'll show you where the jail would have been. Within hours of each other, the city jail caught on fire and the Duluth Mesabi and Northern Depot, which is only a few blocks behind me, or was at the time, exploded. Here's how the Virginia Enterprise reported it. The new city of Eveleth comes to the fore this week as a news furnisher. The fire was started under mysterious circumstances. This is Eveleth City Hall. This is where the city jail would have been in 1902 when M.J. Balm uh, died in the fire that may or may not have been set by him. His charred remains were picked from the debris later. His features were burned to a crisp, and you know, this isn't as much fun as I thought it was gonna be. Well, um, I, I, I could say a little bit about the man who died. M.J. Balm was reported to be a Finlander, even though Balm is not a very Finnish name. I don't know what he was arrested for. Newspaper accounts indicate that he was working at the fail mine, but had a wife and children living in Duluth. I promise the next crime is more fun. A few blocks south, if you look down the street, there's a, a small grayish building which is roughly where the Duluth Mesabi and Northern Depot was located before it blew up. And after it blew up, it was rebuilt uh, roughly on the same site. Because this, I'm sure this is just a garage. The destruction of the Mesabi Depot was doubtless the work of burglars. Part of the safe was found later with two holes drilled into it. It is said there was considerable money in the safe at the time. They used far too much nitroglycerin. The rest of the depot was obliterated. A considerable amount of coin and paper was picked up on property adjoining the wreck the following day. Now that's a fun crime. No deaths, no injuries, and free money flowing all over. You, you can see in, in the one known photo of the aftermath that there are people standing on the remnants of the depot. There is a young girl with her father standing on the wreckage. And I don't know if they were just curious onlookers, or if they were hoping to find some coins or some gold from the safe, we don't know. 
Like any boom town, Eveleth has seen more than its fair share of economic busts. Yeah, d downtown Eveleth reminds me of uh, a seasoned hockey player that once had all of his teeth, um, but over time has, has had many of them knocked out. But people can't help loving this quirky little town. People are very proud to be from Eveleth. In, in a way that I, I think is, is different from, from other towns. Eveleth has probably the largest 4th of July celebration around, and people come back. Some, something draws them back. People, people have a connection to this place. Thank you for watching Minnesota Historia. We've got more quirky stories coming up faster than you can say, oop, I'm just gonna scooch right past ya. Shortly after midnight on August 27th, 1979, an unidentified flying object encountered a Marshall County Deputy Sheriff's vehicle near Stephen, Minnesota. The incident inspired TV's The X-Files, but this is Minnesota, so we're gonna go ahead and call it The Ope Files, as in, oh, I'm just gonna scooch right past you here. Welcome to Minnesota Historia. I'm Haley, your guide to the Ope Files, where we scooch right past the limits of human understanding. This is the Marshall County Historical Society Museum in Warren, Minnesota. Here you can visit Settlers Square. We have family reunions, we have weddings out here. It's, uh, it's fun. Or see a mural which prominently features several Vikings. The Vikings supposedly were in Minnesota at some time. But by far, the most popular item on display is Deputy Sheriff Val Johnson's slightly used 1977 Ford LTD, also known as the UFO car. This car has became more popular in the last 20 years than it was in the previous 20 before that, partially, I believe, because of the internet. I think we're gonna start our tour going this way to our main attraction. This is Deputy Sheriff Val Johnson. He was patrolling County Road 5 just outside of Stephen in northwestern Minnesota. As a non-crime doing person who grew up just a few miles south of here, I can't even imagine what sort of nefarious activities a deputy sheriff might be looking for out here at 1.40 a.m. As he approached the intersection with Highway 220, things got interesting. When he looked to the south, he saw a light. And he turned at the intersection and the light was straight in front of him, hovering about three and a half feet off the ground, eight to 12 inches in diameter. First he thought it was a truck with one headlight burnt out. And then he thought, well gosh, maybe it's a small airplane that crashed. And he speeded up to 65 miles an hour. This feels like a good time to admit that we spent most of the season's special effects budget on these cool vintage maps. Hadn't driven too far down the road and this bright light came straight at him. Again, have you seen our very cool and very expensive vintage maps? So this is bright light that engulfed this car in light. It was bright even with his eyes shut and all I remembered was the sound of glass breaking and then his brakes locking up. 39 minutes later, Val Johnson woke up. He was knocked out and when he came to, he um, called back to the dispatch office. He comes on the radio, didn't start to panic, nothing, just say 406, 400. I said, go ahead, 406. He goes, 1088 at 20 and five. I said, what? <laughs> so we have the 10 codes right there in front. So I look and down 1088, well, officer needs help. Okay. <laughs> So I jumped up, okay, <laughs> and I'm almost panicking, you know, and uh, I said, what do you need? And he goes, I don't know, I, I hit something or it hit me. I says, I don't know, it was a moose, I don't know. I said, okay, he says, uh, I'll get someone out there. I was out at, uh, called out to go out to the incident where the deputy had, uh, he'd gone unconscious. His car had somehow traveled another 584 feet. And then 99 foot skid marks. He was held on the road, it seemed like. He was held on the road for that distance or he should have rolled over or something because he was passed out. And the car come crossways in the road and stopped. Here's where time becomes relative. Let's listen to Val Johnson himself speaking at the Manitoba Conference on UFOlogy on March 16th, 1980. One time there the next day or two, I understand, somebody went up to look at the police car, and lo and behold, the dash clock was 14 minutes late to the minute, which corresponded exactly to our wristwatch. 
This is the part of the story the X-Files loved. Val Johnson's mechanical wristwatch and the electric clock on his car dashboard were both missing exactly 14 minutes. Who's to say that you weren't abducted? Carl, you might have been somewhere else for 14 minutes. I don't know. Like I said, there's, there's almost 40 minutes of my life I can't account for. As a deputy sheriff, Val Johnson is a trained observer. He'd be a perfect witness, but only if he's conscious. I saw him the lay the foundation of the type of guy he is. He was a deputy that they said was always very meticulous. Strictly, I mean strictly by the book. His timepieces were, you know, synchronized with dispatch at when a shift started. Another thing that makes this case unique is that we have physical evidence all over the car. Smash headlight. Ding in hood. That's the size of a dime, you know. Where'd that come from? <laughs> Smashed windshield. Puncture in red light. Bent antenna. Bent antenna. Burn mark. Hello. That is obviously what burned it. And it's like this heavy of plastic didn't burn that easy. Mysterious scratch mark by aliens. What do you personally think? Uh, the object or whatever it was hit you. Well, I think I stumbled it. across something I wasn't supposed to see. That's my personal opinion. So, what happened out there? It's hard to say. I, you know, I leaned to something more natural, like ball lightning or something, but there was a guy that contacted us and he said he could prove it was ball lightning. So I sent them pictures of all the damage and never heard from him again. <laughs> could be something from, you know, from the Air Force Base. We called the Grand Forks Air Force to find out what they had seen on their radars, and they had nothing they had seen. I tell everybody, you know, the whole universe has not been explored. We don't know what's out there. Is it something from somewhere else? Could be. It has to be up what we call a UFO. It's unidentified. That's all we can say, because we don't have any idea what it is. No idea. Was the UFO trying to hit the car or instead trying to scooch right past? Nothing ever hit the car. Nothing hit it, you know, physically they could tell, but something, energy or something went through it and came back out again. Debris come off the road and busted the windshield and that was from the object that finally decided to take off from wherever it was. I'm no UFO expert by any means, but to me, it looks like it's something that started low and then went up and hit the windshield, the reflectors, the antenna. And we weren't there to see anything, so that's just, you good, your guess good as mine. Are you part of a vast government conspiracy meant to conceal the truth from us? I am not, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Yeah, I read them all, all that stuff too, and I, I have to stop. Don't do that, because <laughs> I just put some things in my head, you know. <laughs> Val Johnson suffered only minor injuries from the incident. He had like welder burns on his eyes from watching too bright a light. But he's been hassled by curiosity seekers ever since. I think things just got kind of too much for him and the family, and they moved out of the area completely curiosity seekers. He told a story so many times, and it was getting to be really hard on him just telling the story. And he doesn't really want to talk about it anymore. He deserves his peace, I think, so. Do you even like this car? I love having the car. It's something that most museums don't have. People come all over the world. They call here, they come and look at the car. There's been people laying on the floor looking underneath the car. One guy was here with a black light looking for whatever. <laughs> but we always tell the little kids, we're not going to open the trunk and let you see what's in there. Meanwhile, I just made a shocking realization. This entire museum is like an episode of Minnesota Historia. We draw you in with something flashy, like a UFO car or a vintage map. Then we drop some real history on you. That's our ox cart right there. Yeah, the ox cart was actually used along the Pembina Trail for the Minnesota Centennial. Delmer Hagen, he built this and he had trained an ox and he went from Pembina all the way to the cities, so. You know, we have these artifacts here, but what really makes it 
worthwhile is the people that come. You know, I've had um, seen people where they, they seen some object, like they start crying almost because, you know, it was something their grandfather had or their dad. And I had a lady grab into my arm one time. She was just in tears, so excited about this organ that was her, her father-in-law's. All museums, so they have, they have their items and they're all, they're all, you know, relevant to their history and this is relevant to our history, so. Thanks for watching Minnesota Historia, your guide to all things quirky in Minnesota history. Please become a member of PBS North to support projects just like this.